So there is less emphasis on the negative effect of this green transition on the political economy of that place because when you mine, for example, when you are decarbonizing in de developed countries, you are extracting these resources from these countries. And some of the labor used in those countries are even child labor, and there are other localized problems that this other green transition generates, such as, for example, um, I don't know, there is the scientific name for it, but uh, like there is this uh, local pollution. When you mine, you generate, uh, you generate dust. And the labor is, sorry, the wages, the wages paid to those um, w the workers, they are not competitive. We did um, a couple of presentations on that in Rome. So I think there's less emphasis on the dark side of this um, green transition. And also, I think um, the, I think the power of um, oil, I don't know if to say um, oil multinationals or uh, the OPEC is downplayed here because it will be rational for oil producing countries to ensure that the green transition doesn't happen or happens at a very slow pace because it's just like I, I see it that way like the more um, economies go green the lesser profit for them. Why that is good for countries that um, have high GDP already? I mean, it has less implication. For countries like Nigeria, that is um, a chunk of uh, exports and uh, earnings comes from crude oil, it will, the country will be disadvantaged by the green transition. So there will be an incentive to like stifle the whole, uh, the whole green transition process. So I think this particular aspect was downplayed by the analysis. I am correct. So yeah, that is just a, uh, my observation. That those, these are my observations. Okay. Um. Just, I think I had something very similar to his. My. Um. Thank you very much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um. First was about like e-waste generally, especially when he talked about how a lot of these things are mined from Nigeria. I mean, currently I'm I'm from Nigeria and I, I understand a lot of solar panel installations are ongoing. But I noticed that people have to keep changing these batteries every time. And in a country where we do not have some form of um, efficient recycling companies that could recycle these things, then it's worsening environmental pollution that in addition to the coal that is already still being used. And so um, what I found difficult was trying to reconcile what you said. You said that the dispersion of renewable energy um, sources you know, it's more dispersed in terms of it's sourced from nature compared to fossil fuels where it's a more geographical um, co concentration. I'm trying to reconcile that with the fact that we still have to produce batteries and produce and like buy things from China before we then use these things in developing countries and every other place that has nature. So I really don't know. I want <laughs> I I want to understand that reconciliation. Um, otherwise, it's pretty much almost the same, except that maybe we're trying to reduce carbon in the atmosphere. Just that benefit. Okay, we take traditional questions. Yes, I'm, I'm taking notes because otherwise we forget. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so um, my question is to Fodra, it will be short. I don't really understand the stress of our independence because if we talk about the fight against climate change, we are talking about a global fight, about countries uh, sacrificing in different ways, but yet uh, aspiring to a common future in a common planet. So I see that the debate over independence is fostered with, uh, with fight and with uh, struggle. And so I think that there is this contradiction between aspiring for a common future and then desiring to be independent of each other. And so, yes, yeah, so that is like my main question. My other question is that are those calculations that you showed at first with the losers and the winners? Because we see that in, mi in the Middle East, Yes, we may see some no nominal losers, but also we, we may aspire that the, the regimes will fall once the oil finish, and then the population will have freedom. And as a result, we may see industrialization, we may see science, we may see development. So did the others take those other considerations, or did they simply look at the direct nominal losses? Okay, last, and then we we'll take a second. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. I totally enjoyed it. So uh, I come from Pakistan, so the major issue in Pakistan is the circular debt. So circular debt is, you know, basically it's the difference between the cost of power generation or transmission and then the subsequent r revenue collection from the distribution level. 
So I was checking the statistics and Pakistan's circular debt stands at rupees 2.46 trillion. So it's a huge amount. So, uh, you know, in this whole process, as the high prices are then transferred to the consumers, then in this whole process, the consumers and the uh, Pakistani citizens are affected. So, you know, this is because most of the conditions given by the IMF as a part of their loan deals or mm -hmm. the overall their deals is then that translates into higher energy prices. So this only affects the consumers. So either way, Pakistan is being affected in this process and how then can you expect for a country with such a high circular debt to you know, it's mostly exposed, it's the most exposed country to climate change. So how do you expect such a country to then adopt like energy efficient policies? And I, people say that it's a global fight for climate change, but then you see all these conditions on the other hand. So like, what's your say on this? I have another question. So uh, we were looking at the stats and China is a global leader in energy manufacturing. But uh, when China dumps like plastic products to the underdeveloped countries, isn't this like how such an issue is dealt globally? I would like to know. And because it's on one hand, it is like adopting energy efficient policies. But on the other hand, it's dumping plastic products in the other country. So it's, it's a part of degradation of environment. So that's it. You have four simple yeah. questions. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> they are all very out. We will continue. No, no, no. We, 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 we take a second one. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So regarding the uh, cobalt, totally uh, agree with that. I mean, one of the things that I mentioned in particular, I think at some point, is like it's possible that with this transition to low carbon economies, what we are going to do is to move this conflict from an international perspective to more national, localized type of problems. One of the problems associated to um, critical materials, and I didn't mention because of time constraints, is particularly that. It's the fact that in mining regions, you will have to deal with problems if you overexploit associated to biodiversity. That is, comp it's, it's, we always think of biodiversity as directly connected to climate change, but it's actually not that connected to climate change in the sense that there are a lot of trade-offs between action to foster biodiversity and actions to foster climate change. A lot of trade-offs between, between these things. Clearly, that has to be taken into consideration, avoid over-exploitation of issues of, of particular sites. Above all, when we know there is a concentration of these elements that are absolutely necessary for the transition in order to create this um, decarbonization in a faster way. Uh, people with low salaries, that is when it comes more to the policy side. And that's why all this collaboration between, let's say, developed and developing countries should settle a place for moving forward. And that's where all these multilateral development banks should play a role. There are collaborations between um, particular countries. For example, I know one in, in India between Germany, uh, India, and one of, the, I don't remember if it was the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank, something like that, uh, in which they settle the rules of how to invest or what, what are the conditions for a particular investment in a particular site. So if you want to exploit this particular site and you need this technology and you need the investment of an external investor, a private investor, public investor, you have to do this under these conditions. And these conditions usually involve particular type of policies that has to be implemented, particular type of security um, labor uh, conditions for the people, particular type of taking care of the environment, the biodiversity, the landscapes by the end of the day that we know sometimes, many, that doesn't happen, but that should be the way forward in order to create this decarbonization uh, of the economies and move forward towards the decarbonized economies when we have high dependencies anyway in countries, um, in particular countries, that we can deplete and, and generate exactly the same problems that we've seen during the 19th century, to be, to be honest. So that is uh, one I don't know if 
uh, are content with the. Uh, regarding um, the e-waste, uh, I think the e-waste can connect a little bit as well with with the question of your colleague from from Pakistan. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have an answer to that in the sense that I, I didn't study. Um, I haven't done actually circular economy or or, or innovation since. Uh, in particular, I did my PhD, which was on on this, uh, but it was focusing on on Spain. But this is a huge issue, issue not only in the, um, I would say, developing context of China uh, sending e-waste outside or, or, or plastic outside and all that. It happens as well with um, nuclear waste here. I mean, Spain is buying a lot of nuclear waste from France. It's like we are negating having nuclear power plants, but we are buying the residuals and buying the residuals for you because of the rent we get. We get from these residuals. So a lot of problems associated with that. I really uh, think that all these waste issues can be internalized in countries like China at some point if we actually manage to have this circular economy in place, which is part as well of having a decarbonized, uh, decarbonized economy and having climate change. I mean, climate change and, and this plays, again, a role with the biodiversity. That's why there is those trade-offs. If we are decarbonizing the economy, but at the same time we are generating all these waste, what, what's the point? Um, we have to take that into consideration and we can manage that somehow with um, particular policy mixes. So one of the things that you were mentioning um, as well, and I think that connects as well both of your questions, is um, the prices for the consumer, the um, toll for the consumer at some point associated to, to, to this. Uh, we've seen a lot of issues associated and negative impacts of this particular type of policies that have fostered um, the increase in renewable energy use and deployment in cost not only in Pakistan. I mean, there are, there are a lot of, um, I did a, I wrote a paper, a review, and there is a decarbonization police evaluation tool. I should have put the link at some point, but if you look for my profile, you will find it. Um, in which we analyze the outcomes and trade-offs of 10 particular types of decarbonization policy instruments. And all these subsidies, by subsidies, I particularly look at energy auctions and the uh, feed-in tariffs and travel green certificates generated a lot of increases in electricity prices for final consumers due to the transmission past the cost from the producer to the consumer. Um, generating a lot of negative competitiveness and distributional impacts on that, on that front. How do we avoid that? We need a policy mix. I mean, we need a policy mix that actually kind of recycle, internalizes that cost that is going to be passed through the consumer in a different way. That's it. Can be the government through social policy uh, introducing a reduction in another different type of uh, component. It can be many different things, but that's why we should not think of policy as um, silos, as particular, well, we apply, we have one externality, we apply this policy to solve this externality, and then we have this other externality, and then we apply this policy to solve this externality because the world doesn't work in that way. The energy uh, economy uh, climate system is a system, it's interconnected, there are many loops, and in the same way we need to think of policy implementation in the same way. And because of that, we need policy, uh, we need two things mostly. Policy that is uh, adaptive, so actually is able to change and modify depending on the cost of the technologies as well, because part of the problem uh, associated to this cost pass through the consumers uh, with electricity is related to the fact that um, feeding tariffs were set at the beginning with a particular type of um, support for producers certain level of time, but it was not adapted. It didn't reduce by time. So all these costs reductions that has generated in the, in, the, in the particular technologies has not been internalized in the reduction as well of the subsidy. So we need that this is adapted so there is, n there is not a generation of um, what we call spillover effects 
associated to um, sorry, windfall no spillover effects, windfall profits associated to this particular uh, type of um, of issue. And related to climate, I would like to agree with you, but I can't, in the sense that um, I've been in front of an audience a couple of months ago, Commonwealth uh, countries, um, and there were some people very vocal about if we haven't created this problem, why do we have to pay for this? So I mean, climate change is a global issue, but there are still certain um, segments, certain country um, collectives that say, well, we are the ones that are emitting the list, we are the ones that we have not created the problem, why now do we have to pay for that? And in those cases where we have to sell, and I will say sell because I always think it's a matter of communication, is that this decarbonization process is not only a matter of generating uh, an improvement in the environment, reducing emissions, avoiding, but it's basically going to provide this energy security, stability of the systems, democratization, independency, depending on the audience you have in front of you. So by the end of the day, it's the same message, but depending on the country you are dealing with or the community you are dealing with, the goal that you will need to focus on, that's my particular view, should be different. Because there are still certain collectives and, and certain countries that will not buy the idea that, okay, you create a problem, you pay, why do I have to pay? And that kind of connects as well with this, and I didn't reply to that, uh, the thing about the OPEP countries. So the OPEP countries are not going to change on their own. But if all the countries that are importing oil and gas stop importing because they have the money to become independent by increasing interconnections in the global north uh, with electricity, transmission, distribution, uh, they increase the rate of renewable energy in electricity, but not only in electricity, in energy uh, in particular, these rents will decrease. And if they don't find and in, let's say, an, an alternative, an industrial alternative to that, they will get stuck. So sooner or later, I think that should basically push them to, well, we have to do something. I had a particular student last year, once, uh, one person that I supervised in the Enfilin Public Policy from Venezuela, and, and he was like all the time, at the beginning I had a hard relationship with him because it was like, Guy, think of the environment. It was like, come on, my country produces oil and it's not going to stop doing it because it's cheap, it's cheaper and all that, so it's not going to stop. We have to find an alternative to basically try to figure out how do we get involved in the global economy uh, and all that. And now they are not going to stop as well if the US is um, basically stopping the sanctions and all that because of the situation. So he was discussing as well this, uh, this issue of we will not stop like okay but if nobody buys what you are producing at some point this should um, fall by itself I guess but we will need a lot of um, institutional framework a lot of regulations so it comes at the cost of having this this what we talk about the policy mixes so it's a regulation plus a subsidy plus an alternative so if there is not an alternative you cannot change actually it's like what, we, uh, what I mentioned about the hydrogen. If there is not an alternative to gas, like can be hydrogen in, in particular sectors, it will be very difficult for those sectors to decarbonize because there is nothing else. We need to put that alternative in place, regulate, and then give people this uh, particular alternative. Emphasize the first idea about battery because he, he started by talking about battery for uh, like electrifying vehicles. But the, the main thing is about controllability. There's one of the best arguments of uh, nuclear actors is to say, yes, okay, well, wind, solar, whatever, but it's not controllable. We can't we can't have this on, on when when we want. So we need like huge storage capacity, capacity, and we have to think about this. And then 
this the idea of lithium. We, we talked about cobalt, but I think the next generation of batteries are lithium, and how we, we deal with this controllability, and how we are we supposed to deal with this. And the other thing is about hydrogen, biofuels. I'm always super skeptic with, uh, with this kind of stuff, because for instance, hydrogen, like when you have a CO2 uh, driven thoughts, yes, it's fine. But if you think about all other pol polluting uh, <coughs> material, hydrogen uh, creates a lot of ozone, uh, which was a huge issue in the past uh, 10, 10, 10 years. So how do we deal with the other externalities than CO2 by shifting towards the uh, transition? Uh, no, I just wanted to make an observation just now. Like just did that, for example, for the global global southern co uh, cones in Latin America, for example, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina that hold 65% of global reserves of lithium. Most of them are in, in territories that belong to native communities. So I can see already arising some challenges for us when it comes to this topic. So it's at the same time a blessing and a curse. <laughs> But I think it's also an opportunity when it comes to redefining um, ownership rights for for native communities. And but if we keep in mind also the, the weak institutional framework we have, so I think it's most of a curse that a blessing right now. Yeah, first, thank you for your presentation. It was interesting. But I have an issue with the idea of substitution of energies. Because even though in relative terms you have the rise of the decarbonized energy, the thing is it's been 100 years that, for example, the production of coal is increasing every year. Like maybe the only counter example is during the COVID year, but otherwise there is always more extraction of coal. So what matters actually it's like this thing of absolute term because you're putting the CO2 in the atmosphere. And in any case, if you're going to export more coal, it won't change the power, the, the, ba the balances of power. So yes, about this idea of, of substitution uh, that I don't really agree with. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the presentation. Um, in light of the answers you already gave uh, and the questions, I'd like to ask if you don't think that the conceptually using the, the terms losers and winners is kind of misleading? Because actually the winners, uh, if you think, for example, they, they are the ones, that, the countries that we have this uh, critical material, materials or we transition very fast. But like even today, I don't know, Venezuela is not a winner. Uh, uh, Libya is not a winner. Like what it, maybe Saudi Arab Arabia, we don't know, but mostly depends what is the relationship with the country that is organizing the international relations and the, the global value of change. So probably the, lead, the winners will be the ones tied to China, maybe. But don't you think that, for example, if you keep insisting on winners, creates an idea that, OK, maybe this developing country will win, but in fact, in fact, in fact no, yeah, it never, never happens. Like never a country that is being developed or is on the periphery of capitalism won only by having raw materials. And I think the only uh, way it could happen, and this is the second part of the question, is if there is a change in the value added by the raw materials parts of the production or energy part. Do you think, for example, the smile curve, do you think, for example, with a change for um, more green energy, we can make it less smiley, for example, so uh, these countries that have these critical materials can produce more value, for example. Uh, I don't think so, but I think this is the only way I can see that we can call these countries as winners. So I'd like to hear your opinion on this thing. Okay, you take this, this second round, then I have four or five questions. Um, okay, the the batteries. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, and it, that's related to the uh, intermittency and all that. And we need a lot of investments in in batteries uh, in order to make solar and wind uh, stable in the system. Uh, and that's uh, that's absolutely um, the case. Uh, things about trade-offs, and it comes to the trade-offs again. So it's this thing about, you know, we are producing hydrogen, but we might be generating a lot of ozone, or we are actually, uh, you know, energy efficiency issues related as well to methane. We haven't talked about methane, but methane is a, is a huge 
uh, issue because it has a, a power of pollution uh, way bigger actually than, than CO2. So it's all about, about the trade-offs. How do we handle these trade-offs? There, ha there has to be some, and I will use again the pick, <laughs> pick winners <laughs> or pick losers in terms of technologies. We cannot use hydrogen for everything. It's not the panacea. I, I don't think it's going to be something that we will be able to implement in, in houses or something like that. It will be something for particular sectors in particular places. Um, because of this, because there will be all these traders that we will not be able to manage. That's why we have to think of this uh, in, a, in a systemic way. There will be some for which we still don't know anything. And the first thing I say is like, you've seen this scenario, it's not a prediction. Um, most of the scenarios converge in that way, but everything is still very uncertain. Um, and we don't, really, we don't really know what's going to happen uh, in, that, in that front. But certainly, those trade-offs need to be considered, trade-offs related to other uh, gases that we produce, trade-offs uh, related to land use, there are a lot of trade-offs related to land use, a lot of trade-offs related to um, water, water pollution and water use. And there is a couple of um, papers actually on um, the trade-offs of sustainable development goals and how the framework of the 17 sustainable development goals on the United Nations cannot really be gathered all together because they contradict each other if we want to go towards some goals and not towards others. So the idea, of course, very kind of uh, in an utopian world to try to minimize to the maximum with institutions and policy frameworks. There is this other theory about technology will save us all, but I don't think this is gonna. <laughs> this is going to to happen at this stage. But um, yeah, I I completely agree. The native communities, absolutely. I mean, one of the things we just wrote, wrote a report actually that we presented in the Clean Energy Ministerial in in the U.S. And one of the things we say is we set ten principles for policy making in the energy transition. And we don't talk about native communities except in the um, uh, summary. So in the in the introduction, it's like we need to take into consideration these people into everything. There are a lot of issues, not only in South America, um, Australia and Canada. In Canada, native communities are very um, involved as well with, uh, with the transition. And we need to take into consideration which impacts they have in their communities, which impacts they have in their natural environment, their resources and, and all this. So absolutely, um, again, International organizations, regulation, uh, setting a framework. This is what I can think of at this, at this stage. But it's true, and I was doing this for another uh, program a year ago, that if you look at the um, UNFCCC, the United Framework for Climate Change, uh, what they wrote in 1990 is exactly the same things that we are dealing with right now. So if you actually go through the first uh, declaration and you compare it with the last one in Glasgow, it's like, uh, guys, have we done something in 30 years? Because it's exactly the same wording 30 years after. So I'm starting to not trust that much international organization in that sense. And I think in this framework, local communities, regional governments, and, and the national governments talking with these communities have way more to say um, than particular international organizations uh, at some point. Um, there was the other question about, I don't believe in the transition, the use of energy and the change in the use of energy. Um, there is a thing uh, that I haven't mentioned, I think, at all a single time, and I should have, uh, which is population. Of course, we are more and more people, and if we are more and more people, uh, we might have a lot of issues with this coal production, increases in demand of everything. But we have seen actual successful um, changes in the use of energy in particular coal, for example, in the UK. So the UK has 
absolutely decreased the coal production during the last 30 years. Um, there is, of course, at the cost of, again, feeding tariffs and maybe increases in the price of electricity and gas and, and huge investments. But there were a reduction in coal production uh, from 20, above from 2010. So the government introduced this um, carbon price uh, at a particular level and then complement the carbon price with uh, contracts for difference, which are the feeding tariffs that I just mentioned. And need managed to reduce coal use and increase a lot when, and in particular when, when offshore during the last 10, 12 years. Um, if this can happen at the global level, that is the thing, and that's the purpose of programs like the Breakthrough Agenda, no? to bring these technologies that are at the level of that use. Um, in, the, in the developed world, let's say, in, in, in high-income countries and bring them by 2030 to low-income countries so we manage to reduce this coal production, oil production and all that. Um, we will have to wait and see if we manage to, to reduce. I, I understand that we haven't um, so far as at the extent uh, above in, in the Global South that we would like to see. Um, but we will have to, I guess, to, to wait and see if the policies that it seems to be working, I mean, by the end of the day, most of the countries have now these nationally determined contributions. So they need, I mean, there is no actual punishment if they don't. That's the main problem. Um, they need to comply with this. Um, so I hope at some point this happens. Uh, I am forgetting someone, I think there was another one. Ah, the winners and losers, uh, the winners and losers things. Uh, the winners and losers, yeah, uh, I agree with you. I mean, I, 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 it was not my, let's say, uh, paper. I understand it's problematic and it's, uh, it's problematic as well in how we, what I talked before, no, about selling the message. Uh, if I am going to lose anyway, or if I'm a loser already, why well, I'm gonna care about, about this. Um, in terms of development in, in, in itself, um, I understand yeah, like countries like uh, Venezuela might not be a winner right now anyway, so why to use this? We could, do you have any suggestion? That any suggestion about how can we talk about the countries that might, you know, win something? We can talk more about opportunities maybe, but then, uh, I don't know. For me, there is only. I, it's, for me, it's very hard to see win, winners the way capitalism is structured. For me, it's very hard. Like I, as I told you, looking back to the when I look back to the story of capitalism since I don't know first mm -hmm. hegemony of the uh, uh, Great Britain, I don't see any country that was only a uh, source of raw materials or energy that could uh, develop. There are always like a, an appendix of central capitalism and uh, even though it changed from coal to petrol uh, and now it's changed to renewables these countries they just were used and then discarded and then that's it so it seems i don't know i cannot attach any winning thing to this i, I would say countries that probably could have an opportunity to export more and uh, if they have a internal organ political organization there is not uh, and there is no united states around you to bother you maybe you can use the rents of these exports to create something good for a country otherwise you're going to be excluded you're going to suffer sanctions like venezuela yeah yeah i don't know Since more for me it's only like opportunities but then we have to take in consideration the political international political economy as in general yeah, no, I mean, this comes directly to, yeah, basically it's, by the end of the day, it's the politics of, of um, the, ener yeah, it's the politics of the energy yes. transition. So basically the, the, the idea or the thing is that, of course, I mean, we've seen that these countries, because of the rules of the 20th century, let's say, as you said, they were 
basically appendixes, colonies or whatever, they were exploited somehow. And depending on which was the colonial body, yes. uh, the development is different as well, yes. uh, depending on, the, on, the, um, on that. I <laughs> think, I mean, capitalism, of course, has been a lot of, <laughs> uh, has a lot of issues to, to deal with. But I really think that the institutional context we have now is different on that front than the institutional context we had in the past. Which, it doesn't mean it's better, because we've seen big failures uh, of, of this framework very, very recently, very recently any, anyway. Um, if we frame this instead of winners and losers as, of course, opportunities and risks, uh, we will be able as well to introduce all these distributional concerns, all the fact that countries, if they don't, I mean, the, the main issue with this is that most of these losers, uh, as your colleague mentioned, Pakistan or, or whatever, um, are the ones that are going to suffer most the consequences of climate change, extreme weather events, and will generate a lot of uh, economic losses if they don't. Um, engage with that, of if the rest of the world doesn't engage with that. So that's the thing, in this framework, it's very important all the um, coordination between countries, not only for growing institutions, but actually for creating markets for particular technologies, reducing costs and all that, and avoid that these countries that are more exposed, which are most of the time the most or the poorest one already, will win or not lose as much as um, they can reduce the risks, let's say. But again, this is super uncertain. There is a lot of problems related to that and to measurement. So one of the things is that I'm talking about policies, but all the way, the way in which governments chooses, government choose which policies they are going to implement are not or are decided by these ex-ante modeling, integrated assessment models, blah, 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 that don't take into consideration distributional issues. They basically take, these are the costs, these are the benefits. If benefits outweigh the cost, that can go. And there are a lot of issues associated to three particular types of distributional issues that are not considered, which are intertemporal, I mean, in the sense that I am now enjoying this weather, but my grandchildren if might not. So what is this distributional issues associated with a, 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 a forest for the Amazon that we have now and the Amazon that we might not have in 30 years um, and inter-country um, and intra-country. Differences within each country to access to different particular uh, environmental um, resources, but inter-country in the same way. They will have different risks to deal with, and most of the time the countries that will suffer the most are the ones that have created, that have not created the problem. That's the, the framework. You, you, you were not at the seminar before. Oh, no. Matthew would have explained you that black hole could be uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I think maybe an observation as well, and I'll, I'll think a quick one. It just it strikes me that what's missing from this analysis is a consideration of power, because it seems like in all of these situations that you're talking about, they're in perhaps some reality where power is not playing a big part. Like you're talking about how cobalt mining in um, in Congo and how in Nigeria things can be more equitable based on a situation where a country can negotiate with an industry and somehow have an output that's super fair and super socially just, power is what's missing from that consideration. And I think in a lot of the things that you've been suggesting as potentially solutions, it's missing an analysis of power of how the technologies that we have in these Western countries will not be gifted to the global south. And again, power... Will not be, sorry? Gifted or you know, with power relations there that have been intentionally concentrated and I think will not be dispersed. So I guess it just really struck me that power was what was missing from your analysis. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation.
Um, I have two short questions. So first, I thought it was very interesting that first one of the first graphs you showed that showed the difference in, in energy sources uh, in the past decades. And for me, what struck me the most was the downfall of nuclear energy. And of course, I think last COP26 here in Europe, there's a big debate about nuclear energy between France and Germany and so on. So I would, I would like to know your opinion on what you think is the role of nuclear energy in the transition and how the current crisis in Europe can change this geopolitics. Uh, and then the second question is... <laughs> Just a question. Just, just uh, to say. <laughs> <laughs> that one has to be answered. And then the second question uh, on the graph about developing countries. I've seen there is a great importance of solar energy, and not much change about hydroelectric energy. Uh, also, would like to know your opinion about that. What's the role of hydroelectric energy? Yeah. Also, just to build on his question, uh, I don't know your opinions on nuclear. But uh, do you think that, I mean, the presentation was mainly focused on renewables, so uh, hydro, solar, and wind. Do you think those will be enough for the future? Uh, thank you. I have uh, one specific question. You mentioned that um, France, uh, there was a conflict around interconnection between France and Spain. Uh, so I wanted to ask why and to build on it. Um, because we are like the countries are like interconnected through the like uh, European market, energy market, and I wanted to uh, ask you like from the yeah European perspective, what do you think? Because there is a lot of debates on um, reforming the energy market um, uh, in face of the energy crisis. So, um, yeah, uh, what what's your take on that? Like, would you go for uh, some kind of reform that would uh, maybe um, help um, um, deal with the energy crisis. And then the second one is, yeah, to build on Clio because, um, and on the, on the kind of movement of like indigenous people, but also we see many movements like in Serbia uh, against the lithium mining. And we see also many uh, um, protests again, even like renewable, <laughs> Uh, sources like in Mexico mm -hmm. uh, against wind uh, farms or um, in Canada against or China against building uh, water uh, hydroelectric uh, power plants and then you th then you mentioned that uh, bank like uh, because developing countries need investment in order to help to do the energy transition uh, which can be invested by the banks, but then that's kind of the part of the problem where uh, the banks uh, and the developed countries have an interest in, and they're kind of coming in with the investment and also with the, with the private en interest. And I'm thinking, like, we know about this problem, but do you think or do you see that there are some ways of mining or some, like, mining projects that could... Um, be based kind of on the um, bottom up uh, local uh, power and that could actually avoid these, these issues of like financial capital coming in uh, to make a green investment but also kind of destroying the um, yeah, local uh, environment or society. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, so my question about the energy transition is that um, of, um, this doesn't talk about like it doesn't uh, like Gabriel pointed out and Cleo as well. It doesn't uh, destructure capitalist mechanisms. And if the ecological transition happens at the cost of a lack of social transition, then it will be that the poor are again expected to sacrifice their own requirements in order for global growth to occur. So uh, my question is, is it acceptable to have an uh, ecological transition that does not take into consideration, consideration social factors? Like, is, is it not better to have degrowth instead of energy transition that affects the poor? Uh, yes. Um, I was wondering, because you mentioned before that basically the policies, the policy ideas for a transition have not changed over the last 30 years. And so I was wondering if there's like maybe also some research going on on like how to change because you mentioned the institutional framework 
of how to like change the framework in a way to enable an actual implication of the policies we know are good since 30 years? Okay, I feel that there would be some frustration, uh, but uh, last question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the policy aspect because I think we didn't discuss it much here. Uh, because I always think that uh, developed countries have this paternalistic perspective when it comes to them acting towards countries in development. For example, in Bosnia we had a big problem because the uh, EU basically stopped uh, the development of a new thermal block uh, that was supposed to um, replace three others. Uh, because the three others were not in line with the current EU energy policy. But their problem was, okay, it wasn't good for the environment, but the bigger problem for them was that it was financed from a Chinese investment bank. And so the problem is that in the end, we didn't replace the thermal blocks that were, out, that were supposed to be out of power because they're 50 years old. And the other thing is, like, just because it comes from a source that they don't like, it is soft. Which just shows that, I mean, when you're a small country in development, like, policy is politics. And not much can be done from the perspective of a developing country, because we need the money, but we can't get it from a source that might be more useful to us. Because the EU did not want to finance this. Thank you. Okay, I think that was the last. Yeah, uh, <laughs> great. Uh, let's see if I took notes uh, adequately. Uh, power. Um, power uh, touches all, I think, all the other questions that everybody has been talking. I mean, certainly yours, certainly yours. Uh, who is exerting power? In which way these global north countries are setting the rules of the game? Uh, in which ways all the evidence is actually based on what we know in the global north and we have no idea because there is no information, we have no data about where it's going in the global south. Absolutely. Uh, one of the main problems, and I think I touch in her questions and your question, uh, is this idea of official development ed. Um, I'm doing a research right now and it touches as well on your thing about uh, politics and policy. I'm trying to disentangle if the reasons why countries donate, well donate, that's donate is another word, but provide these funds for climate mitigation, in particular developing countries, is because of they want to access to these critical materials or because there is actually a very um, friendly interest in reducing climate issues, increasing environment or not. Um, there are different frameworks for that. The first thing is that certain countries, like for example uh, France, invest in other countries because of colonial ties. Countries like Germany invest in other countries that are similar in terms of policy and in those countries in which they have the power to establish the policies that they have been advocating for. Uh, and that is something that it's what the data so far, it's preliminary analysis, is telling us. Okay? So there are there is a lot about, well, there was this colonial tie here. Maybe I can keep having a kind of implicit power over here if I can access the critical materials, exploit these, provide funds, and make the development of this particular country in the way I want it to happen. Um, the other thing associated to that and that is complicated in terms of um, in particular official development aid and the 300 billion, um, dollar, billion dollars that I mentioned before per year is that most of this climate official development finance takes the form of loans, soft loans, okay. But then who is donating what? Nobody is donating anything. You are giving these countries certain amount of money to develop to create infrastructure, uh, innovation, uh, technology deployment, whatever. But by the end of the day, they will have to return you exactly the same amount with a little bit more, even if it's a soft loan. Are we really supporting development and are we really supporting sustainable development? There is a question, I mean, I didn't mention because I really want to be optimistic uh, uh, about <laughs> this. Um, but I'm very, um, yeah, no, it's not, it's not pessimistic, but it's, it's like I don't see, really, if we are actually 
discussing the idea that, well, we need to innovate, we need to provide the, the means to facilitate transition, not only here for us that we already have the technology, but also for other countries. Loans of loans are not the, are not the way. And I understand that grants might have more complications <coughs> and the grants might generate as well uh, more problems of power, more problems of this is conditional to this, this, this and that. And most of these loans are already conditional to this, this, this and that. Which has trade-offs, has good things, I mean it can be conditional to you protect this, you increase your uh, level of employment in this particular uh, way, you increase labour conditions or improve labour conditions in this particular way and so on. But at the same time, you are exerting this kind of soft, what we call soft power in the same developing count, um, countries and perpetuating the relationship that we've seen during 19th, 20th century in the 21st. Absolutely. Um, nuclear. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's a good question and I will hear, I mean, that's my very particular view. Um, I don't think nuclear is the solution. I think nuclear is very good right now as a, an alternative. It, it's already constructed if we have the plants and if they are safe. But I don't think investing in new nuclear is the way forward. If we can invest in batteries that should, with all the problems related to lithium and all that, should give a stability to the system together with uh, the solar power and the, and the wind power. Uh, investments in, in nuclear power are crazily expensive, way more than any other technologies. Uh, it's the only technology, as I mentioned at the beginning, that hasn't reduced cost during the last 20 years. So it's a stable, we haven't seen reductions in cost of the technology and it takes ages to construct. So actually it's not going to solve the, prob the problem that we have now. It might improve problems that we might have in 30 years, but we don't know which problems we are going to have by then. So I am not, let's say, and this is a debate that I asked in particular in, in COP26 to someone from Germany, because more and more in talks, I was receiving the question, there are two questions that always happen, nuclear and the growth. They, they, are, they are always there. Um, and they told me in Germany there is no debate about this, it's a no-go, really? nothing. But we know that in France it generates a huge amount of the, of the power right now. I am not, I mean, let's say in favour of shutting down if they are safe right now, but I don't think the problem with supply that we might face this winter is going to be solved by new investments in nuclear that will be working in X number of, of years. I don't think it's the, the, way, the way forward. Um, but it's a very particular view and to be honest I'm not basing this in more evidence that the fact that I know constructing a nuclear power plant takes way more than uh, another type of infra energy infrastructure, it's more expensive and the technology hasn't reduced cost. That's, that's uh, all the evidence I have about, about this. Uh, hydro. Hydro have many problems uh, associated with land use as well and the, and the disruptions that it generates. So that's why, I mean, most of the focus of the transition is it's, uh, around new technologies like small hydro or wind and solar most of the times and the need of batteries and storage and investments in batteries and storage and try to understand how to um, actually uh, uh, make these intermittent sources at least uh, a little bit less, less intermittent. Um, hydro has as well the problem with uh, floods, uh, sorry floods, the other, drafts. <laughs> in particular places, but it's true that countries like Brazil has a huge amount of hydro, I mean probably at the expense of destroying a lot of natural environment, environment there, and they are generating already um, income from exports of, of uh, electricity and energy related to, to hydro, but most of the debate will be solar and, and, and wind because of that. Because hydro, big hydro powers have more or less the same problem as well than, than nuclear. It takes ages to make it, a lot of disruption associated to as well 
communities, people, uh, just transition and, and all this. Uh, if solar and wind is enough, uh, solar and wind can generate so far a huge amount of the electricity we consume. Uh, some countries, some days, actually consume their whole 100% of uh, electricity mix, in particular uh, times of the year, only with renewables, and most of the time is solar and is wind. But on their own, are not going to solve the problem because of the intermittency uh, that we are talking about. So we need huge investments in batteries, in order to compensate that, and by the time being, we need some type of backup energy, what we call no, like nuclear, that manage to stabilize to stabilize the system. But it is possible to have um, at least models say that it's possible to have a 100% electricity system based on renewable energy. But we need more interconnections as well, more distribution, and more coordination between countries in order to be able to, I mean, I'm not spending this solar energy today there or this electricity that I've generated to solar, I will pass it through the, through the net and it doesn't get, get lost. But we need, as I said, a more as well investment in, in distribution, interconnections and, and all that. Um, uh, more things. Uh, the, the, the you were, I, I don't know exactly what I wrote here about you. You were saying about something about the not in my backyard. Um, the sustainable environment example. Okay. Yeah, no, no, exactly. No, but it's exactly that. So there are a lot, and it's not only with mining. It's, it's with mining, it's with uh, wind infrastructure, it's with, with solar a little bit less because solar infrastructure can be smaller uh, and generate less problem. But this not in my backyard syndrome is something that is well known. and people are usually not on board, so they are happy to have something close enough that generates jobs, and we say, well, generate these green jobs, whatever, we transform the economy, but far enough for not get disruptive to to certain extent. Uh, that connects, I guess, with uh, what your, your colleague has, has mentioned as well about um, Capitalism, uh, or it was you, the, the, the one that said about the capitalism. Uh, yeah, I, I understand it's a problem, and it has been a it has been a problem, and we will not transform our economies if we don't get people on board. So that's why it connects with the just transition. Can we actually minimize trade-offs in some way through? policy framework, and I always go to the policy framework or the institutional framework, or as you said, communities. So this power with uh, in, in national governments, regional governments, local governments. I did some research about um, how it's called, how they are called in, in France. I don't know, but it's like credit, um, it's like these community banks uh, that basically credit cooperative, something like that. There is not a lot about the topic, but there are some initiatives of small communities that have financed their own um, particular installations of mostly solar, more than mining, uh, with credit from their own, uh, their own citizens. This, of course, increases the general acceptability of the projects. For mining, it can be a little bit more difficult, obviously, but you need to involve the communities on, on it because otherwise it's, it's not going to fly and, and needs to compensate uh, anyways on how the, the trade-offs between one and the other. And there will be a seminar uh, in January about uh, citizen ship ownership uh, for electricity. Yeah. And I think the last one, it was the growth and capitalism and, well, no, there was two more, the growth and capitalism and all that. Um, sorry? The most simple. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We still have one minute. Another, another one. It <laughs> um, I have a colleague, Matthew Garwala, that always says the same. If you don't grow, the pie is more, smaller, and we are more and more people. So I will, I'm not a huge advocate of the degrowth movement, because I don't think if we don't generate enough resources, we will be able to basically host the 10 billion people that we will be. 
Uh, can we integrate the circular economy, the um, reuse of things instead of creating new elements or new output from our own economy? Can we reuse the outputs that we already have to generate this growth? I think that's the way to go. So not exploiting more things because we know the resources are scarce, but I don't think at this stage countries are going to buy a degrowth um, message and it comes again to the communication kind of, kind of thing. Um, yeah. Uh, and the Bosnia case, uh, yeah, it's, it's related to the, the first question, of course. I mean, there is a lot of politics related to China is financing this, I will not go with that. There is um, conflicts associated to countries not trusting other investors. Uh, that is one of the things actually that I am also looking at this paper that I mentioned about the, the interrelations between politics and policy. So it's once there is a donor there, if other countries will go there, so if having other donors in the same country increases the probability that this country receives more development aid, or on the contrary, it decreases because you cannot exert the same level of power. And what we see is like most of the countries will like to, most of the donors will like to have someone there, but still be the one that donate the most because this reduces the risk of your investment, you are sharing the risk with other donors, but at the same time, you are in the power position, coming back to the power position. But this, and I, I haven't gone that, that uh, far on, on the analysis, is always related to who is the donor there, and if you can actually talk or trust this donor because of the politics behind the the, the investment. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you.